It is my great privilege to welcome you, all of you, to the 186th, just think about that, 186 years this has been happening, 186th convocation at Union Theological Seminary 
in the great city of New York. I want to begin with a practice that began at Union last Earth Day, and that is with a land acknowledgement. Union Theological Seminary acknowledges and honors the land on which this building stands as Lenape Hoking, the homeland and territory of the Lenape people as well as the habitat and dwelling place of many beings of which we have been in relationship to and which the Lenape Hoking knew well, including plants, animals, birds, spiritual beings. We pay respect to the Lenape people's past, to this present, and the future, and express support for the flourishing of indigenous peoples and lifeways within this place. It's a beautiful way to welcome us in to this space by honoring the rich history and all all the life here visible to us and not. Today we come together at convocation, having come through a period of enormous isolation, in a period of enormous political and social turmoil, and we come as people with complex histories, pasts, into this present moment, which is just adding another layer to that complex history, looking towards a future we can't yet imagine. And so I want to welcome all the many people who are here, especially I want to honor all of our facility staff who worked to make this place beautiful and to make this campus spring to life in our courtyard. So. I, I want to say a special welcome back to all the administrators who are here today who sat behind computer screens all summer. I want to say a special welcome to all the returning students and alumni here who are here. Welcome back. Welcome back. I want to say a big welcome to the people sitting on these rows right here, our esteemed faculty. Wow, it's good to see you all. Special welcome to the mighty Vice Chair of Union's Board of Trustee, Rhonda Joy McLean, who is with us. Yay. To, I will not yet say her name because it will be said soon, but our almost newly installed Dean. So, yes, welcome. <laughs> And last, but certainly not least by any means, to the entering class of 2022. Welcome! Welcome! Convocation comes from the word to convoke, which means to call out. And today, that's what we're doing. We're reminding each other of all the ways that we're all called out to be in the world, but especially the entering class of 2022. You are called out to be in this place at this time. Make no mistake, you are meant to be here. 
And before you stretches maybe a year, two years, three years, five years, seven years, well, let's see, we'll see, <laughs> in which you have the chance to work hard, to learn with mighty spirit, to expand, to be transformed, and through the midst of it all, hopefully experience a delight unlike that you have known. Welcome to this place. Claudio? We have arrived. We have arrived. I learned with Thich Nhat Hanh, our precious Thich Nhat Hanh, that at every step of the way, life is full completely full. Every step of the way we have arrived to what life has prepared for us or what we have made of life to be. In every step of the way, the past has been fulfilled and the future is already gathering us. It was Thich Nahan who taught me to say that at every step, I have arrived. I have arrived. And this is changing me every day. So as we gather here, I want us to say this too. I want us to say we have arrived and so I'll say a phrase and I will ask you to repeat two times. We have arrived. We have arrived. All right and so I'm glad our drummers are helping us today. So friends, today we have arrived at Union. We have arrived. Two times. We are grateful for all the ancestors who brought us this far and all the spirits of this place. Here we are on the Lenape people's land that was stolen from them. This is where we stand. Coming from north, south, east and west. We arrive gently to a land that has been here for millennia. We arrive gently, but holding different beliefs, hopes, desires, doubts, and debts. We carry entire different reasons, but with all of that, we have arrived. We are not alone here. We are now together with many other beings living all around us. They are living at Sakura Park, Riverside Park, Morningside Park, here on campus, inside of our rooms, on their land, we have arrived. With clouds and the sun and the strong winds of this land, with rain and snow, with old and new trees, birds of many kinds, worms, fungi, spiders, ants, grass, plants, squirrels, flowers, insects, mice, so many mice, all of whom call this place their own place, we have arrived. With all of our pets around our campus, with the soil and local farmers who provide food for us. We are blessed by an incredible ancestor near us, the Hudson River, to whom we all we own honor at the shores of the Hudson River for a new year, a new life, new learnings, new challenges, new wonders. We have arrived. For challenges, complexities, difficulties, blessings, and gifts. To care for each other, to strive to understand each other, to be gentle and kind to each other, to offer smiles and warmth with various understandings of God, gods, goddess, goddesses, no God, we have arrived. With expectations, but not fear. With trepidation, but not laziness. With eagerness, but no, not discouragement. With free spirit, but not bitterness. With desire to be affected and to be transformed. Yeah. For the past is unfolding. 
The present is right now being recreated and the future is now being called. We are called to be here, my friends. We are called. And we? So now bless this land. Bless each other. Because we are ready to begin. Because? Today I would like to read the poem Accents by Denise Froman. My mom holds her accent like a shotgun with two good hands. Her tongue all brass knuckles slipping in between her lips, her hips all laughter and wind clap. She speaks a sancocho of Spanish and English pushing up and against one another in rapid fire. There's no telling my mama to be quiet because she don't know quiet. Her voice is one size better fit all, and you best not tell her to hush. She waited too many years for her voice to arrive to be told it needed housekeeping. English sits in her mouth, remixed. So strawberry becomes a strawberry, and cookie becomes a cookie, and kitchen, keychain, and chicken all sound the same. You see, my mama doesn't say yes. She says, aha. And suddenly, sky in her mouth becomes a nectar level song. Her tongue can't lay itself down flat enough to the English language. It's got too much hip, too much bone, too much conga, too much cuatro, too much two-step. It's got too many piano keys in between her teeth. It's got too much clave, too much clap, too much salsa to sit still. It's an anxious child wanting to make Play-Doh out of concrete. English is too neat for her kind of wonderful. Her words spill in conversation between women whose hands are all they got. Sometimes our hands are all we got. And accents remind us that we're still bomba, still plena. And when you say huepa, a stranger becomes your hermano. When you say dale, a crowd becomes a family reunion. See, my mama's tongue is a telegram from her mother, decorated with the coquis of El Campo. So even though her lips can barely stretch themselves around English, her accent is a stubborn compass, always pointing her towards home. This year, may you wrestle with the tongues of your elders and ancestors as you find your own voice, one that too points home. And so in my welcoming, there are three people I would like to say a special welcome to. Um, Isaac Sharp, visiting professor. Uh, Rima Vasli-Vad, who is not with us today, who is also here as a visiting professor. And our new visiting professor of history, Jorge Rodriguez. <laughs> Okay, so now we start the part of the celebration where we install our new Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean, the Dr. Sue Young Pak. Oh. And before we start, I would like to ask um, her wife Kathy and her daughter Jocelyn and her granddaughter Isabel to wave your hand. I, don't, I, I bet that's the first time a granddaughter has waved at her grandmother becoming the dean. So there is so much to say about our new Dean Sue Pak. She knows this school with so much 
breadth of heart and wisdom and long-standing knowledge. She knows us inside and out. She was a student here. She knows what it means to be sitting up there, just starting, and all of that anxiety and hope. She knows what it means to be a doctoral student, thinking about what your vocation holds for you at Union and at Teachers College. She sat in that position and spent many hours in that Burke Library. And then coming not very far, actually across the hall, <laughs> she sat in the admissions office and welcomed generations of students to this place. And then she was in the Dean of Student Life's office hearing the woes and the joys of many classes of students. Then she took the huge step and became the chief development officer where she devoted her time to raising money for this school. That's a, that was a big leap to do that <laughs> one. And she did that with such grace and joy. And then she stepped into the office that she recreated the Office of Field-Based and Integrated Learning. And that's where many of you know her from, as she cultivates and creates places across this city for learning to take place. And so it is with great fullness of heart and expectation that today we welcome Sue into yet another space at Union, at the helm, the faculty of the students, of all of this work happening here in this chapel where I remember you getting married. And today you step up here to become the dean. What a great joy. Would you please join me? And Rhonda Joy, would you please join me up here? Good afternoon. Okay, no people. No. I'm from North Carolina, Southern Baptist Church Bible Belt. Let's try this again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's going to be all right. <laughs> I read for you now the preamble to the Constitution of Union Seminary. A number of leaders in the city of New York and Brooklyn, being deeply impressed by the claims of the world upon the faithful to furnish a competent supply of well-educated leaders, impressed also with the inadequacy of all existing means for this purpose, <laughs> and believing that large cities furnish many particular advantages for conducting theological education, resolved unanimously in humble dependence on the grace of God to attempt the establishment of a theological seminary in the city of New York. The founders hope and expect to call forth from this flourishing city, genius, talent, and world-transforming zeal. It is the design of the founders to provide a theological seminary in the midst of the greatest and most growing community in America, around which all people of moderate views and feelings who desire to live in freedom and to stand aloof from the extremes of doctrinal speculations and ecclesial, ecclesiastical domination <laughs> may cordially and affectionately rally. Dr. Pock, I ask you to state your intention as requested by the Constitution. I promise to uphold the principles and purposes of the seminary as set forth in the preamble 
of the Constitution, adopted by the founders on the 18th day of January 1836, and in the charter granted by the legislature of the state of New York. So having stated your intention, I now declare Su Yong Pak to be duly installed as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean at Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much.
From the first water is the body, Natalie Diaz, and the use of the erotic, the erotic as power, Audre Lorde, a remix by Alicia R. Ford. We carry the river, its body of water, in our body. We carry the river, its body of water, in our body. I mean river as a verb, a happening. It is moving within us right now. This is not a juxtaposition. Body and water are not too unlike things. They are more than close together or side by side. They are the same. Body, being, energy, prayer, current, motion, medicine. The body is beyond six senses, is central, an ecstatic state of energy, always in the verge of praying or entering any diverse movement. Energy is a moving river, moving my moving body. Energy is a resource within each of us called the erotic, which offers a well of replenishing and provocative creative force if we do not fear its revelation. Its revelation that the dichotomy between the spiritual and political is false, that the breach which connects them is formed by the erotic, the sensual, those physical, emotional, and psychic expression of what is deepest and strongest and richest within each of us, being shared the passion of love in its deepest meaning. Recognizing, not fearing. Recognizing, affirming, embracing the power of the erotic, the energy that is move, moving river, moving our moving bodies and connecting us to all that is within our lives, giving us the creative energy to pursue genuine change within our world rather than merely settling for a shift of characters in the same weary drama. We think of our bodies as being all that we are. I am my body. This thinking helps us disrespect water, air, land, one another. But water is not external from our body or ourselves. What we do to one, to the body, to water, we do to the other. Will we remember then where we've all come from, the erotic, the water, inextricably united with all that is and each other. Different yet the same being, energy, prayer, current, motion, medicine, body. Union community. New and returning students, new and returning faculty and staff, President Jones, Board of Trustees, alums and friends, both present here in the chapel and those of you joining us remotely. I am honored to be standing here as a newly installed Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean at Union Theological Seminary. I ask for your prayers, your support, as I step into this new expression of my vocation as a theological educator. No one takes life's journey alone. Among my many companions, my family, friends, colleagues, teachers, mentors, I am particularly grateful for my parents and my ancestors whose journeys have made my journey even possible. As this weekend is Chuseok, the Korean Harvest Moon Festival, when Koreans for over millennia have paid respects and honored our ancestors, I remember them 
today with gratitude and invite them into this space. This occasion has given me an opportunity to think more deeply about what matters to me, namely, what it means to be a learning community. Is anybody here? I learned to read bodies. As a 10-year-old immigrant with no English except the first three letters of the alphabet, my first attempts to communicate were through my body. I took it in the new and foreign worlds through images, movements, and gestures. In the playground and in the classroom, I became an avid reader of bodies, constructing meaning in my own head, creating narratives for myself, accurate or not, it became my third language. In time, my ears and tongue assimilated to the sounds of the dominant language, though this habit of reading bodies never really left me. Even to this day, when I'm in places like a ball game, I habitually read bodies around me, how they move, how they interact with each other. So while my partner Kathy is glued to the ball game, I sit, tolerate the ballpark food, and read bodies. I enter their world, or more accurately, my construct of their world, as I imagine and narrate a story for myself. Now, the skills serve me well. When my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and I became her primary caretaker. With her failing memory, her ordered linear chronos was interrupted by the disordered protrusions from the past. Her world was a fantastical reordering of events, relations, time, and space. And some days she was back in northern Korea of her youth, and on other days, she was reliving the Korean War as a nursing student. In order to connect with her, I had to enter her world, wherever she was, and not demand that she be in mine. While we first understand this disease to be that of the mind, that is, the loss of cognitive memory, it erased bodily memory to the extent that she forgot how to dress herself, to eat, and finally to swallow. Entering my mother's world was not just about tending to her mind. Rather, it was tending to her body that was progressively being transfigured by her illness. Bodily practices like holding her hand as she walked, feeding and bathing her, brushing her hair, changing her diaper, and tucking her into bed became a lingua franca. It was about reading her body and her bodily needs when she could no longer communicate with words, at least the words that I could easily understand. So what does it mean to be in a world that your body does not occupy? To say it another way, how do I embody a world where the natural laws do not permit my bodily presence? As I struggled to remain present with my whole being to my mother's emotional, mental, bodily, and spiritual needs, I later came to see where my, my body was tending to her body. What happened to my body when I entered her world? Did I leave it behind? Was there some sort of time-traveling transfiguration? How did this disrupt my linear, and normative understanding of space and time. Parenthetically, I would later understand that this is the stuff of contemplative practice. Well, you see, bodies are messy, they weep, they bleed, they extrude and expel, they hunger and thirst, 
They hold and respond to desires. They are sensual. They are miraculous wonders that break down. They're inconvenient, and we really need them. They are a site of deep intimacy and violence. And yet, or perhaps because of its messiness, we tend to ignore, deny, and denigrate the body. The millennia-long suspicion of the body in many Christian traditions has created a body-negative theology that breeds body-negative lived religion. And this leads to a dual, invisible, and hypervisible body politics. For example, to have illness is to be painfully aware of the body. To be in a non-normative body is to necessarily draw attention to the body, whether that is a racialized body, a gendered body, a queer body, or differently abled body, missing the mark of the white, straight, cisgendered, male, able body gets us either erased or noticed as tar and targeted as the problem and our embodiment as sin. For the non-normative embodiment that I inhabit, and I suspect this is true, so some of you, many of you, not being in my body is not an option. I am perceived as having a body that does not fit the racialized and gendered norms. My Asian woman-identified body is a target for random acts of violence against Asians, particularly against women and elderly during the last two years with a rise of violence against Asian. And being in a queer, racialized, and gendered body means that my desires, my sexuality become stigmatized markers. As such, I am noticed not only as having a body, but having a hyper super body, hyper super sexual. I become reduced and noticed to acts that my body performs, a performing acts of non-normative sex. And in religious language, these body acts are considered immoral, a form of disordered desire. It is another form of body denial and denigration which perpetuates violence. Is any body here? To begin to chip away at this body denial, I suggest that we engage desire and eros. Desire and eros are significant elements for articulating queer theology of queer lived religious experience. To live queerly is to live against established norms and requires an energy of eros, passion, and desire directing us toward a more authentic lived reality. For me, such queerness is essential in my vocation as a theological educator. It helps to foster the formative aspect of education in its goal to shape our deeper, authentic, empowered self. The erotic energy connects to the development of a selfhood, as Kathleen Talvaki articulates it, becoming selfhood in relation. Thus, queerness is connected to teaching and pedagogy at its core. After all, education, educare, is a formation process that shapes people into becoming who they are called to be. It leads them out from the depths of their being and their desire, which is also where God is. I want to make a case here for a body full, body honoring, heart-centered learning community. Is any body here in our teaching and learning? What does it mean to offer a body-centered classroom with a full-bodied pedagogy? What happens when students and teachers enter into learning space with their whole bodies, even in Zoom rooms? What are the necessary conditions for becoming selfhood in relation? That is to say, for an ongoing development of a self that is rooted in communal relations. 
What and how are we to teach and learn that honors not only the life of the mind, which has been privileged in the academy, but honors the body and the bodily knowing? How do we train and cultivate our bodies so that we act from a place of discerned compassion instead of just reacting from pain and fear? What if we took the risk of creating a container that facilitates this bringing of our bodies, which includes our minds, to this learning enterprise? And yes, this way of teaching and learning is slow, <laughs> iterative, and is necessarily practiced and context-based. It embraces what David Orr calls slow knowledge. It is community-based, relationship-based, shared, connected to ecological and social contexts. It is heart-centered learning that leads to deeper understanding of our humanness in relation to the living world. It requires that we as teachers and learners are willing to risk vulnerability and be open to the slow unfolding of wisdom. It requires and cultivates compassion. So what I'm advocating for here is radical embodiment to disrupt the supremacy of critical thinking in the academy to become more of an equal partner in the educational process. Radical embodiment makes explicit the null curriculum of the body in our teaching contexts. It is an attunement with the body not only as a repertoire of knowledge, but as an agential constructor of knowledge. By cultivating body and emotional literacy, it calls attention to the embodied dimensions of power and privilege. Tending to places where our body holds memory and knowledge, emotions can guide be guideposts and partners to that unfolding wisdom. This is important as trauma is held and perpetuated in the body. For communities and people forged in the crucible of trauma, this body work honors the deep healing needed for both the individual and collective bodies. And this work ultimately is spiritual work. While one can engage in various spiritual practice as necessary for this work, I want to advocate for contemplative practices because they're fueled by energies of eros at the core. The desire and yearning for deep intimacy with God in the world have been the mystics and contemplatives life journey. Centering eros as spiritual practice cultivates our capacity to live on the boundaries where we are open and receptive to others with vulnerability and attentive presence. Contemplative practices open up our hearts and resist binary perceptions of the world. And whether it's the Buddhist loving-kindness meditation or Tong Son Gido, Korean Christian ecstatic communal prayer, or the quiet Orthodox Christian prayer of the heart, these practices cultivate wisdom and offer us an opportunity to recalibrate our relationship to the, with each other. We enter into these practices with a desire to be connected to the ultimate other, whether the other is God, the transcendent, or the natural world we live in. And these practices are slow. They take time. They slow us down. But in our society where time is a commodity, and to quote Douglas Christie here, where time is mortgaged to the point that we experience time as unlimited indebtedness, let me repeat that, where time is mortgaged to the point that we experience time as unlimited indebtedness, contemplative practices are countercultural, queer, and even revolutionary. Is anybody here? So what does it mean for us, union community? I welcome your engagement 
with radical embodiment and invite you to offer your wisdom as we collectively figure this out together. For now, let me offer three suggestions. First, make. A Japanese-American artist, Makato Fujimura, in his book, Art and Faith, A Theology of Making, asserts that making is a form of knowledge. For him, and I quote, making connects knowing with our acts of love and with the greater reality behind materials and the body. Caring and loving are the fundamental elements of the act of making. And whether your making is of painting, poetry, song, cooking, creating hospitable space, cultivating relationships, or having difficult conversation, which really needs the body for, need to pay attention to the body, this art of making enfleshes our community. We are invited to be artists of everyday life. Second, breathe. I grew up in a Christian community whose motto was a family who prays together, stays together. And we were subjected to many, many hours of family Bible reading and prayer meetings led by my Presbyterian father who was an elder with a secret calling to be a pastor. This in time I have come to appreciate as a real formative spiritual experiences of what makes a family. Now I want to revise that motto a bit. Two, a community that breathes together, flourishes together. I've been moved by the writings of Alexis Pauline Gomes. Her book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, is a meditation of poetic wisdom gained from observing our aquatic cousins on breathing, even when everything around us, including our history of oppression, makes us unable to breathe. In fact, it makes us drown. Let me offer her beautiful words here, and I quote, I breathe in shape. I shape my breath to wind through winding paths ahead. I shape my head to fit the purpose of my breath. My breath is prayer, the shape of life, evolving name. All I can see is just the blur that says life moves. I stay in prayer and reach to listen for your breath. I stay in prayer and reach to listen for your breath. And I would add, breathing is fundamental to our contemplative practice. It commits us to the slow way, closely attending to the inner life and witnessing the sacred being revealed in each moment. So, how might we breathe together as a community? How can we shape ourselves to fit the purposes of our breath? How might we listen for each other's breath? Third, care. During New Student Orientation, we engage around the theme of community, care, and courage. And you'll hear a lot of resonances here. And while there are different modes of care, I am drawn to Monique Moultrie's framing of care, that is, care as a form of resistance. While primarily speaking as a woman of color scholar in the academy, her wisdom can be applied to other contexts where risk has been taken and are in need of care and healing. She lays out a useful threefold paradigm of care, aftercare, including triage care, assessing the level of damage or hurt. Long-term care, how one prepares and sustains through the long haul. And collective care, which includes self-care in community, 
and caring in, by, and for community. By attending to care, we resist the breathless push and pull of the neoliberal market-driven economy of work, whether we, that we are, we are what we produce and what we do, that our worth is necessarily tied to our usefulness to the unceasing mechanistic grind towards some notion of progress. So we stop, we breathe, we make, and we care. What might care look like at Union? Who is present and who is absent in this caring ecology? Do we share the equal burden of caring? How might we commit to care in this community? With more questions than answers I offered, I invite you to explore these concerns together as a community. And yes, this is hard and slow work. It is not efficient work. Rather, it is faithful work. It requires radical embodiment and critical thinking. It requires a commitment to be in bodies together, bringing our whole selves to this journey of teaching and learning. Is any body here? Remember, remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is that life is, remember. Thank you, Dean Pot. For all who are gathered here today, carry this whole afternoon with you as you move into the year ahead. And now we come to the part of this service where we all have some making and breathing and caring to do together. So at this point, I invite the incoming members of the seminary, students, staff, and faculty to stand and declare your intention. 
So please stand, all of you who are new to Union. And declare your intention written in your program. In gratitude for Union Theological Seminary's heritage and commitment as first declared by the founders in the preamble to the Constitution, we pledge to help Union recognize and carry out its mission in our time. And now, I would like for everyone else to stand and respond to this declaration of intention with a welcome and a thanksgiving. With thanksgiving for those who have led you here and for your faithful response to their call, we pledge to support you as you join this community and this mission. I invite the returning members to continue to stand and to declare your intention. In gratitude for Union Theological Seminary's heritage of freedom and commitment, as first declared by the founders in the preamble to the Constitution, we pledge to help Union recognize and carry out its mission in our time. And everyone responds, especially our new incoming members, with thanksgiving for those who have led you here and for your faithful response to their call. We pledge to support you as you continue in this community and its mission. So may it be. They asked us to give a prayer, and I said, do you want a good old Southern Baptist prayer? And they said, no, keep it light. <laughs> so let us pray. Gracious and loving God, Father, Mother, Creator, Spirit, and all the names that we acknowledge you by, we thank you for your new beginnings and unwavering provision. We trust that your peace will watch this class as they step into a new beginning. Oftentimes, our new beginnings can be very uncertain, resulting in fear and doubt. And we hope that they will rely on the riches of your love and grace in moments of adversity and of triumph. We ask now that your spirit abides as they and their family celebrate this grand milestone. May they find comfort from our community's continued embrace and support as they journey through this chapter of their lives. And we ask all these things in all that is good, all that is holy, and all that is love. Amen, Ashe, Shalom, and peace. And peace.
And now for our <clears throat> benediction. May the mystery of the word fire your imagination. May the mystery of silence be your companion. May the gift of friendship sweeten your journey. May you strive for learning, but always for the sake of wisdom. May you awaken to your own most compassionate heart. May humility be your watchword and your guidepost. And may the blessings of wonder, love, and communion be with you now and forevermore. <laughs>